you almost look amused that people have turned out to uh, to come and watch you. No, it's good. It's uh, it's uh, I mean it's uh, it's something wonderful. I I, I was I, I've been asked over the years to, to come along, and I, I I've always sort of said no because I suppose I was feeling a bit shy about it really, but. Uh, I think it was about the third time of asking in about 15 years, so I felt as I was being a bit rude, so it was about time I said yes, so I'm just pleased on such a sort of dark and miserable night, there's so many people here, so it's good, I presume I was, it's free. I was saying to Paul before that the, uh, the committee member that invited him asked me whether we should invite him, I said well he, he, don't bother, he won't accept and, uh, and here we are, so yeah, thank you so much Paul no. for, uh, for joining. <laughs> I wanted to start uh, my questioning um, with where you started and how you got into comedy. Um, what, what got you first interested in comedy? How did that develop and, and, and end up as your, uh, your vocation, I guess? Um, I think it was just... Uh, I, just the, the, uh, clowns at the circus it was, was, the, was the thing that really sort of first did it for me. There was a a circus in Olympia uh, that ran after the Second World War through to the early 60s that was uh, like had a 3,000 seat a tent, you know, so you had this massive marquee. And I was about sort of four or five, something like that, very early age. And I saw the clowns, and I'd never seen this as, you know, there wasn't a lot of TV around in, in those days, so I don't think I'd seen clowns before. I'd certainly never seen adults behave like this, because adults were usually the people who said, no, get off the furniture, or, or you know, it's time to come in. Or they, they weren't sort of dressed in baggy trousers. Uh, they weren't like these adults who were sort of like, who drove, who, who drove cars where the doors fell off, or they'd lasso each other with sausages. And, and 3,000 people laughing was such a a powerful feeling that I, and I remember at one point that uh, they asked for volunteers to go into the ring and I was, you know, I was too far back and I was too shy and I was too late putting my hand up. But from that moment, from that night, that evening, I, I wanted to be part of the process that was making all those people laugh. It would have been enough for me to just to sort of pick up the props after they'd left. Or in, in to, just to be part of the whole business of creating a huge bubble of energy and laughter that was just, you know, simple little clown tricks which they, you know, they've been doing for centuries where you see somebody fill a bucket up with water and then you, somehow the bucket gets switched and you don't notice it and they throw the bucket over the audience and it's all confetti. And that laughter of thinking you're going to be soaked by something and then it's just confetti and everybody roaring, it just made a, a huge impact on me and it, it, for me, it, it was, yeah, that was the first time where I just sort of the power of laughter in a big space, the power of laughter to transport you, no matter what your, your problems were at that point, to just sort of flush through your brain these endorphins, these chemicals, you know, that just sort of like made you feel happy. It just seemed to be the most extraordinary process. And to, and to be part of that, I think, was sown in my heart from that very early experience. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm right in saying that your sort of path um, from that point into comedy was more traditional, conventional. Um, but nowadays things are changing quite a lot with social media uh, and those sorts of things. Do you think the, the path into comedy is, is very different to, to how the, the path that you followed to get into comedy? Well, I was very fortunate in that the time that I, uh, the, the comedy store opened up in London in 1979 and the big thing about the comedy store that was different was that you, um, anybody could get up and give it a go. It didn't mean that necessarily you were going to be any good at it, but you had, the, you had stage time. Essentially, you had the chance to stand on stage and try and make people laugh. Before the comedy story, and that's, so I was about 22 at that point, so it was, it was a very good time for, for me. The timing was perfect. Uh, before that, the, you know, we looked at sort of Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, uh, Oxbridge people, that was one way in. Um, which I wasn't, I wasn't going to happen for me. Uh, holiday camps, red coats, that was another way in. Or work in men's clubs in the north. So none of those three options would have been... I, I wasn't naturally a gregarious character, so oh. judging the knobbly knees contest at Butlins wasn't going to be any good for me. Um, so those were the traditional ways in, because musical had long since sort of disappeared and variety theatre had disappeared. So the comedy store has opened it up, and, and the more that people do it, I mean, when I started doing it, the idea of doing stand-up comedy was as akin to saying you wanted to be an astronaut. It, it seemed to be an impossible, incredible thing. But um, nowadays, I mean, there's thousands of people doing it, so that it, it's, it's, it's more difficult in other ways because there are so many more people doing it, but there are other venues. It's, it's easier, I, I think, probably to find somewhere where you can get up for 10 minutes and do an unpaid spot somewhere, just to give you a little bit of experience about what it's about and to see whether actually temperamentally you can do it. My great fear was I had this really big ambition to do it, but until I tried it, I might not be any good. 
And so that was, the, that was the big concern. So I was very fortunate the first time I played the comedy store, I'd had this idea. I'd seen this documentary uh, back in uh, the, the late 70s about a, a, a police operation called Operation Julie. And this was a police operation that was in Wales. And basically what had happened, there were some people making the drug LSD in this factory in Wales. And the police raided this place without being aware that there was a lot of LSD dust in the air. So they ingested this without being aware that they'd ingested it. And there was a documentary about what happened to these policemen afterwards. And there was a very... I just remember this piece of dialogue as I was waiting for a bus one evening. This policeman was talking to camera about his experience. And he said, uh, I was sitting in the pub with Detective Inspector Norris when I noticed that my pint of beer was getting bigger. <laughs> And it was that combination of sort of describing a hallucination in a sort of like deadpan policeman way that I realised was that there was a comic friction there. And so I, I, I went back to the bedstead I was living in and I, and I spent about three or four weeks just writing this four minute thing about a policeman giving evidence in court describing his hallucination in a deadpan way, but describing, you know, meeting Marilyn Monroe or whatever it was. Uh, and and the, as I say, the, 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 the connection, the, the, the friction between what he was saying and his delivery made it very funny. And so it was the first thing I did at the comedy store and they loved it. Uh, I was very lucky because it was the best thing I had for about 18 months. After the, uh, every gig I had for the next 18 months started off really well and then started to go downhill because I didn't have anything as good as that. But it, in a very, the very first time of getting up on stage, I knew that I could do it and I had the temperament to do it. I'd even sort of written down the lines for the policeman so I could be consulting a notebook, so I, you know, to make sure I wouldn't forget it, but I didn't need it. And I found that on stage I had the temperament for it. I wasn't too nervous that I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that was your first breakthrough. And the, the, yes. sort of, the, the second one uh, that I, I would say, say was the breakthrough into television. And I think it was on Channel 4 you, you first sort of uh, yes. entered. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about how you got into television, whether that was something you'd always wanted to do? Well, it was, but it also I was in no rush to do it. I suppose being some of a working class background, I had in my head that, and also my knowledge of other comedians, you know, a history of comedians, it seemed to me that the people who spent some time getting to be successful were the people that success lasted. So I, I thought of it as like being a five-year apprenticeship, to go and just do sort of, you know, odd gigs here and there. I was lucky the cabaret circuit was starting up at that time, so the first year I did 30 gigs, the next year I did 60, the year after that it was like 100 or something, so there was lots of sort of, there was lots of opportunity to get on stage, make mistakes, get better, improve, realise something, you know, timing, if you delay a laugh, you can delay a laugh by the way you time the joke, all that sort of stuff, which I find, find fascinating, because it's not a science, it is an art, and I, I, I realised that all those make those mistakes when nobody's watching and, and learn from that. So I felt by the time I, I got to television that I was kind of ready for it. I didn't want to rush into it, you know, because there, there are lots of people can, you know, you can rush in and come out the other side. And um, so far it's it sort of worked. You know. <laughs> it has, yeah. Um, well, what you are known for is this, this deadpan um, mm. brand of comedy. And so when you entered into television, did you think, consciously think, okay, I need to go in with that persona? People need to see me on screen. Yeah, I, mean, it, I think it came from the policeman on acid routine, which is what I called it, with the policeman being very deadpan about his experiences. It, it, I, I knew it wouldn't be funny if he thought what was happening to him was funny. He was deeply embarrassed by, by, by the hallucinations. And um, there was a thing in our family, now there, there were no rules in comedy, because whatever you say can be proved by the opposite, but our family used to, did, didn't like comedians that laughed at their own jokes. But actually, Billy Connolly is somebody that laughs at his stuff, and he's supreme, you know, so there is, there, there, you can't say that he's a bad comic, you know, he's, he's one of the most incredible comedians in the, since the Second World War in this country. And, um, but so it seems sometimes by being deadpan, you can extend the laughter by looking like you don't know what people are laughing at. So it's, it's, it's a technique really, you know. So I do it sometimes on Have I Got News For You where I, I say something and just sort of, you know, just look around and wonder what all the hilarity is about. But it's just, you know, it, it's just a technique. Yeah. Um, the, it, looks, the, it looks more charming than probably thinking you're the funniest person in the room. The, uh, the sort of next step after that, I guess, was you started pre to present quite a few mm. um, really prominent um, shows. Um, and I was actually wondering whether there was a difference in, in your approach to presenting a show or just being on a panel. 
Well, when I, I did a series, I, I did a series uh, called Room 101 that ran for many years, and, and the, uh, we interviewed people like Spike Milligan and George Melly and, and John Peel and, and quite a few big names. And the, the point of that programme for me was to create a platform, rather like what you're doing now, create a platform for the person that you're interviewing. That's, that's quite rare these days. Quite often the, the idea of a person that presents a chat show is that they, they are the star and that the person they're interviewing is sort of like revolving around them a bit. But I, I always felt that if we could get some idea, because on Room 101 the idea was, you know, you got rid of things that you found personally irritating or annoying or whatever. And you can find out about somebody by the things they dislike as much as the things they like over the course of an hour or so. We'd cut down to half an hour. So each one of those shows I felt was different from the other ones because you're getting something of the personality of the person that you're interviewing. So that was, I wasn't trying to make myself the star of it. I, was, I once interviewed Johnny Vegas, who was talking about his addiction to online uh, computer games. And uh, he, he became riveted. I, I, I didn't have to say anything for about 10 minutes just listening to him. And at one point, I mean, generally in the interviews, I always like to ask, a quest, ask questions that I knew the answer to, that I knew would lead to somewhere. And he was, you know, he said, I'm just addicted to these games, Paul, I can't stop. <laughs> and I said, well, how, what's the longest you've ever sort of sat in a chair playing a, playing a computer game? You know, he said, well, I think it was 24 hours. <laughs> and my jaw just dropped. I had no idea he was going to say that. But it, it was fascinating. I didn't feel I needed to sort of interrupt or come in or whatever, because I knew that what he was saying was absolutely, you know, riveting. Yeah. Well, I, I've got to now ask a little bit about have I got news mm. for you? Um, and it, certainly for me, it's been a, a, a show that I've grown up with, my, my mum and brother. A lot of people and, have grown up with it, well, yes. Yeah, indeed. Um, I wanted to ask about sort of the political correctness that we're seeing and sort of how that relates to the, the TV show, and whether you found something you were asked upstairs is whether there is uh, a, a joke that can go too far. Uh, do you think, uh, and actually one we were talking about just before was whether um, the, the programme can lead to cynicism, uh, cynicism of... of Politicians. Yes. Um, what are your, what's your comment on that and, and sort of how the TV show could have some negative impacts uh, in that regard? Well, I think maybe we've, I mean, it was a good question somebody asked upstairs. I, wasn't, I, I think suppose it's, it's not necessarily that we're bringing the politicians in dis, into disrepute. It's their actions themselves that are, that are often doing that, you know. Um, I would draw your attention to the fact that Ian Hislop, who is a, a, an Oxford man, um, loses virtually every week uh, against a boy who has a comprehensive school education. So I wonder whether the education you're getting here is as good as you think it is. Because, <laughs> because the imperial evidence is over the last 28 years. I mean, Ian gets very annoyed about not winning, but I think it's... I, I, I tend to guess the, the uh, missing words round more better than he does. That's where I tend to sort of score, score the points. Um, but um, in relation to your question, um, yeah, I mean, you have to... It's, it's always, there's always been sort of... Uh, making fun of powerful people. I mean, Charlie Chaplin made the film The Great Dictator, which was essentially a, a parody of Hitler. Um, he said afterwards, this is before they knew about the, the, the sheer real horrors of the Nazi regime, so he wouldn't have made the film if he'd known the full, you know, what had happened. But um, in Hollywood, they didn't know, you know the, the film companies didn't want him to make this film because they didn't want to up upset the, you know, European audiences or the German box office or whatever. But you, know, you, have to, you have to draw attention to when people are being idiotic, I think, because you know, Trump or whatever, you know, you, you, it's, we had him on the other week showing a, a, a marvellous clip of an interview and saying to him, you're not very humble, are you? And he said, listen, he said, I'm the most humble person you've ever met. <laughs> You, you couldn't believe how humble I am. You know, so if we don't, we have to laugh at that, even though he's also a scary figure. Hmm. Um, uh, throughout, not just Have I Got News For You, but all the programmes you've done, who has been the, the, the funniest or most outrageous guest that you've had to engage with? Probably the favourite host, Bruce Forsyth on Have I Got News For You, mainly because of the effect it had on Ian. Because... Um, <laughs> Ian, Ian had a television set that didn't have an ITV button on it, so um, he'd had it removed by Harrods uh, at you know, an early stage. <laughs> and so he, when, he, when Bruce was doing Play You Iraqi Cards Right, Ian was right, you know, he, he was appalled. He had never seen the show Play Your Cards Right, it was an ITV show, and so, so turning over these basic pictures of war criminals was something that, uh, it, it was the, the, the friction, as I was mentioning earlier about the policeman on acid, the friction between Ian and Bruce Forsyth was very clear. They, they were, this was the only place that we were ever going to meet, 
And uh, yeah, that was fun. That was fun. It's, it's, uh, I was going to actually bring up Bruce Forsyth. Mm. Obviously, he was the one who awarded you the BAFTA in yes. 2003, and then you subsequently awarded him the BAFTA. Yes. Um, which is a, a strange set of Well, it, the whole thing was very surreal because, you know, as a boy, you're watching this program, Sunday Night London and Palladium, and Bruce Forsyth is on it, and you remember watching it when you were five. And then there you are, sort of whatever it is, 40 years later, 45 years later, and he's given you an award on the very stage that you're at. And as a boy, I, I, I never dreamed of something like that happening because it seems so ridiculous, that it seems so implausible. I hoped that one day I would become a professional comedian, but the notion that he would give you a prestigious award, I mean, it is, it's, you, you can't dream of those things because it just doesn't seem real. Yeah. Yeah. Was, was he an influence on a lot of your presenting? Um, I like don't his? know. I mean, he sort of... He, I mean, he was, what he was really good at with Bruce was sort of like, he is, um, you know, he was a skilled pianist. He played a bit of jazz piano. He was a dancer, you know, he was a singer. He could do all these things. Uh, but his dedication to what he was doing, the dedication to rehearsal was, was very strong in him. And uh, yeah, we had him on Room 101 once and on, on uh, uh, Have a Good News. He was a huge fan of it. You know, he was a huge fan of the show. And uh, he phoned, up, phoned me up one day to sort of test the waters to see whether they'd sort of like have him on as a host. And I said, yeah, I, you know, I, I think it'd be great. I, it's, I can't say yes myself, but I'll, I'll talk to the producers and stuff. And uh, yeah, I mean, on the night, he, was, he knew how to handle an audience. He knew how to sort of reach out to people. Uh, myself and Suki, my wife here, once went to Ronnie Scott's The Jazz Club in London with him and his wife. And my fame just disappeared completely standing next to him. It was like I was holding a candle and he was a lighthouse, you know, because <laughs> he was just so famous that all eyes were drawn towards him. And he did have a, he had a kind of magnetic personality as well. He, he was an extraordinary figure. And to, to survive that long doing all those shows over the course of, you know, whatever it was, nearly 60 years, you, you have to have something special about you, I suppose. Yeah. Um. Something you've done um, a lot more recently is, is uh, been on radio quite a lot. Mm. Um, and I was wondering if you could give us a comparison of, sort of the, the two mediums, how you have to, because obviously you can't have that straight face look around on radio. Yes. Um, how, how, how you have to approach those differently. Um, well, it's, I mean, radio, stage, TV, they're, they're all different, but they're all essentially the same kind of thing. It's interesting on radio, with just a minute is probably the show you're thinking of. Um, it's coming up for its 50th anniversary. Nicholas Parsons is 94. Uh, he was 30 when the Queen came to the throne. He was 15 at the outbreak of the Second World War. I mean, it is extraordinary life. He's, he's actually mentioned in the Bible. I mean, it is uh, <laughs> in, the old, in the Old Testament. He, he's one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say that really, but anyway. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, that, it's, it's great fun, but it's, it's, it's interesting that sort of uh, how that people miss what's happening on the radio to a certain extent. It doesn't paint the full picture because you are just listening to the sound. You, have, you haven't got the, you, you're not seeing. There was, some, there was one person that used to play the game on a regular basis that was really sort of like difficult to work with, who was always frowning and scowling during the recordings, who always sort of looked daggers at you if you dared interrupt them or challenge them and yet listeners never heard never saw that they they just always say, oh she's very good isn't she you know and so you don't want to disabuse them but actually sometimes you can get away with stuff on radio because people aren't literally seeing the whole picture so that, that's one of the differences I suppose yeah, I want I want to look now at some of the, just the technical side because mm. a lot of people will watch have I got news for you in those sort of shows but I want to know sort of how they work and how that comedy comes together. Mm. Um, so how, could you explain how scripted How I Got News For You is? Yes. Um, what, if you do improvise, whether, how often that's allowed? And, and well, I mean, the it, essentially what happens is that the person in the middle who's, who's got an auto cue, so they're, when they're looking at you at the screen, they're, they're seeing the words in front of them. So they're, they're, that's all scripted. Uh, because they're introducing film clips and they're asking the questions and they've got all the various things. All the stuff that myself and Ian and the other people do isn't scripted at all. And you can tell, really, because, you know, I'm often, what I say, I'm ad-libbing off something that somebody has just said next to me or what that person has said over there. So that can't be rehearsed. And an audience can always tell the difference. You know, you, if you try to present something that is essentially improvised that isn't, audiences would smell a rat, they would know, because the, 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 you can't, I mean, when we go out and tour, we do a, you know, we do a lot of tours and stuff, and, and sometimes journalists say, well, are you ever tempted to do the same jokes over and over again? Well, it, it's much easier not to, because first of all, you'd have to remember whether you did this joke 
now? Did you do it half an hour ago or did you do it last night somewhere else? And, and it, would, it would feel awkward, it would feel semi-staged, it wouldn't feel natural. It would be like watching a football match where the footballers had predetermined exactly what they were going to do. It, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't feel real, it wouldn't feel right, it would feel somehow there was some fakery going on. But no, essentially, I mean, they, sh they show the, some of the questions beforehand, but that's essentially mainly for the guests. I mean, you know, the opening question will be something very big news story, which is mute footage, so they're told there beforehand, this is where you can talk over this, so talk about what you're seeing. So it's easier for them to know that before they go out into the studio, you know. But essentially, they try and maintain the quiz element of it, so um, the odd one out things, and you'll see quite often we don't know the answers, so that, that sort of indicates that it is a genuine quiz, because if we did know the answers, we'd be, some of us would be much better at it than we are. You do have a, a good go at some, some guests that you have on the show and uh, I, th I was wondering, there must be times when you have friends that come on and you accidentally have a good go maybe because they're friends, you have to come up and be like, look, I'm sorry, we, we maybe took the joke too far there. Um, I Does don't that know a... that I don't tend to sort of like, I, I don't tend to have a go at the guests um, that I can remember. I mean, my body language is very, is very clear if I'm sitting next to somebody I don't like. Um, <laughs> I usually sort of have my hands like this and my knee... No, I usually... Um, <laughs> I was sitting... <laughs> oh, I crossed my legs. Or, you know, I, no, I, was, I was sitting next to a UKIP uh, representative a little while ago and you, it was very clear that I wasn't enjoying it, you know, so... Um, but no, uh, you, I don't tend to sort of... I, I don't tend to have a go at it. Ian is being the, you know, a journalist, is, is much more forensic in his questioning. And, and so... Quite often I will sit next to somebody who I don't particularly want to sit next to, but it helps Ian because it's easier to be a sniper than a, than, than a dagger. If they're sitting next to him, I mean, he will still do it, but, and, and he, you know, but it, it's, it, it makes life a little easier if um, they're sitting next to me. So, but no, generally speaking, no, I mean, if they're friends, you just, you want the thing to be... I get a bit nervous when it does get a little bit sort of rancorous because my, my DNA, I suppose, is that it should be, I'm trying to be funny the whole time, you know, or, or trying to make things funny or whatever. Um, but, you know, part of the show is sometimes, you know, uh, when, we, when Boris was first on the show, Ian gave him a hard time um, about something that Boris wasn't happy to talk about and um, he didn't like it at all. I remember, uh, I remember that. Yes, yeah, you yeah. know, so, it, well, so Ian, I, I take my hand off to him, you know, he, he does a good job in those circumstances. Yeah. And other than me, of course, who, mm. who uh, have you not had on Have I Got News For You that you'd like to have? <laughs> Would you like to do the show? Well, yeah, if you invite me. We, I, I, maybe I'm famous <laughs> enough from YouTube now. Um, it, it's not entirely up to me, but uh, yeah, I can put a, rec I'm put a recommendation in for you. I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been going for so long now that, that, anybody, that everybody that wants to do it, uh, because some people don't want to do it at all, and aren't interested in doing it. I mean, Victoria Wood would have been, I, I, I'd only met her fleetingly a few times, but I always a huge admirer of her. I just thought she was just incredibly good. Uh, her sketch show from about 30 years ago it still has sort of, you know, real sort of incredible classic moments in it. She was a very talented person. We, we tried several times to get her onto Room 101, but she was, uh, you know, she didn't want to do it. And it's, you know, some people don't. And uh, maybe Have I Got News For You wasn't her thing either, really. But um, it, I would have loved to have been on it. Yeah, it would have been fantastic. Um, my, my final question before we open up to the audience is, mm. is just looking forward for you. Are there any sort of projects that you, you have in your mind that you want to work on a start uh, that you haven't really touched on? Well, the one area that I haven't, which is, uh, is for me, the, the, you know, perhaps the most potentially rewarding area is, is to make a film. I've made documentaries over the years about early cinema and stuff. We've made a Hitchcock one and a few other ones about very early cinema. Um, we've got a screenplay at the moment where we're trying to sort of hawk around a bit and, and, and adapt and change and make it sort of what we want it to be. That, uh, to direct that, that would be the ideal thing because I think by going back to the circus thing is that sort of um, directing your own material is just is such a joy. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind if I wasn't in it. It wouldn't matter to me not to be in, to, you know, whether I was in it or not. But to be able to create that world, to be able to sort of say to somebody, I tell you what, if you just stick your head out of the dustbin there, that's so much funnier than doing it there. That kind of thing where you, you, your years of experience lend you a sense of instinct 
based on experience, which gives you, so you go, oh yes, that works. I made a short film a long time ago called The Suicidal Dog, which um, went out in cinemas. It was a 10 minute short, it was, went out with the Billy Elliot film, and that was great. Uh, to, to go to a cinema and, and see something you've made on a big screen with people, oh yeah, that, that's, that's, that's something special. So that's, that's the one un unfulfilled ambition, I suppose, is to maybe make a successful movie. Okay, great. Thank you so much for answering my oh, question. Oh, yeah, but time went by really quickly. Thank you. Yeah, um, Thank right, you. we're now going to open up to the audience. So if you have a question, please raise your hand nice and high and wait until the microphone comes to you. Um, yeah, let's start with you at the back. Yeah. Hiya. Um, Hi. This is a bit of a contentious one to start off with, but here we go. Um, recently, Joe Brand was uh, presenting the show, and there was a bit of a, uh, a moment where she gave everybody a bit of a licking over the fact that uh, some people on the panel may or may not have been a bit crass about the Westminster scandal. And I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that, and also about the problem of having all male panels and kind of diversifying comedy and making it less of like an old boys club. Well, thank you. Um, I, I'll, I'll take your second point first about the, I, I was, it was Danny Cohen who was the controller of BBC One a few years back who said that there should be women, in, you know, we should have a, women represented on these shows. And I totally agreed with that because I, and I, I agreed with him making it public as well. I, 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 I like it. I do like having, you know, more women on these shows. Just a Minute, which we do on the radio, quite often has two women and two men and has done for a number of years. Um, the Joe Brand thing, I mean, it was, Quentin Letts was kind of setting the tone um, and really her remarks, I felt, were more addressed to him. I didn't feel that I was being ticked off over anything because I hadn't sort of, you know, I, I, don't think it's a, you know, I don't think it's an easy subject for humour. It, it's sexual harassment and it's horrible. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm not going to sort of get into the sort of thing of sort of saying, well, there's nothing wrong with a hand on a knee because it's all part of the same thing in the end. You know, it, it's, not, it's not acceptable behaviour. Um, I don't think she, I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm glad she said what she said. I, I think it was unfortunate that we had Quentin Letts on, who didn't seem to, you know, when he, he, there was one point he talked about uh, the Guardian journalist, journalist Polly Toynbee and said how he, you know, he wanted to pin her down and tickle her. Now, it's a jocular remark, but it's the pinning down is, that's the very thing that we're talking about that's, that's horrible, that, that, you know, we, 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 we're saying we, we don't agree with. So. That was unfortunate, but I think what Joe said was, was fine, but I don't think Have I Got News For You generally has a, has a problem with having female panellists on it. We have, in fact, I think there's two women on this week, I think, Victoria Corrins hosting and um, Sarah Pascoe's one of the, the guests. So for my money, I, I think it's always better. I think it's always better to have, I just think it's, you know, it's a better mix. You know. Just to sort of follow up on that, mm. um, one thing you were saying before was, uh, just when we were in the bar, was about when uh, you, some people make jokes about Donald Trump's comments on North Korea, for example, really mm. serious issues that you don't think should be sort of trivial, trivialized or, or put into a comedic context. Um, how, how do you are you able to influence sort of the jokes and the script of Have I Got News for You? If you oh, like, no, oh, actually no, I object I to this. No, or? I mean, I mean, I can say uh, afterwards. Um, I don't think you. Sh I mean, that, yeah, there are there are jokes that occasionally get into the script which I don't think should be there. Um, and I will say that after the recording, because I'm not aware of the script beforehand, because it's the person in the middle that's doing it. And they, they would, I mean, I don't think there's ever been an occasion when they haven't listened to me. You know, they've just made a misjudgment on something and it hasn't worked. And they, well, you know, I think that's not a good gag. And the audience's response tells you that anyway, even though you, you know it yourself, you know, you know it yourself. There are some jokes which are just, no, that's not good. There would be, um, a, mis uh, a misguided joke about Jimmy Savile or something that was just like, oh, no, 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 no. So, you know, that's, but you get a bunch of writers together in a room and they're looking to, for edgy material and sometimes they go, you know, they go too far. But that's okay, there is a, you know, that's, it happens. It hasn't worked, it's not right, it's not appropriate. It comes out, you know. Do those writers who produce the script of the presenter actually try and make it funny, or are they just wanting to provide material for the panellists to make fun? Oh, no, they're going for I mean, the, the, and I think some of the writing in this series has been very strong. Uh, there's been some very good jokes. Um, uh, but, yeah, I mean, they're, they're trying to make it as funny as they can, but uh, I don't know too much about the process of that because I'm not there for, for that. But it's, there's, a, you know, there's a room full of 
mainly male writers. I don't think there were many female writers on it. I think there may be one. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not part of that process. I don't see any of that. I just arrive on the day and I hear the script as it has been written over the course of three or four days, you know. OK, next question. Gentleman here. Yeah. Okay. You can probably hear you, actually. Um, I wondered, you mentioned the Donald Trump joke about, uh, well, the Donald Trump comment about being humble and that kind of thing, and I wondered if you think the absurdity of some of the politics at the moment um, is a benefit or a disadvantage for your comedy, because I know that, for example, Saturday Night Live in America has really benefited from the ridiculousness of... Uh, the current American political situation, but I wondered if it's also a bit more difficult because you're you're trying to make something funny out of something that already is. Funny. Yeah, I think there's a different. I mean, like the Saturday Night Live with Alec Baldwin doing an impression of Donald Trump. That's funny because you're seeing somebody doing an impression of Donald Trump, and they used to have. Uh, Steve Bannon was represented with a sort of like, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Grim Reaper and things like that. That's a different thing. For, there was a programme in the last series which started off by showing my first question was uh, Donald Trump uh, being verbose about some, some North Korea and then seeing uh, Kim Jong-un firing missiles into the air. Now, that, that, the audience weren't amused by that because you're showing them footage that's actually, you know, potentially very scary. If it had been somebody pretending to be Kim Jong-un or, you know, playing a part, you're removing it from the reality. And that's where Saturday, Live, uh, Saturday Night Live has, has scored well in the States because they're able to lampoon Trump rather than just visually showing him. They're showing somebody pretending to be him. So there's a distance um, which isn't so, uh, which is, is more comedic. Does that right. make sense? I think so. Yeah, yeah good. Thank good. you for the question. Uh, yeah, let's go to you. Hi there, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, whether in your career with Have I Got News For You, has there been a particular time when you thought like, wow, this is a busy news week? And if so, why? Um, it's hard, I mean, I, it's hard to remember sort of, well, there's, there was one week, I think, when there were a few years back when we had a new Pope and Prince Charles got married in the same week, so that was quite a big story. Um, it depends, because sometimes, it, this is a strange time now in terms of the programme because you have two stories which are just running the whole time, Brexit and Trump. So there's always some variation of that story. So it's hard to find stuff that's amusing about Brexit that hasn't been said before or, you know, amusing upon the whole thing, you know, on the, on the very subject. It's, it's sort of something that people aren't particularly wanting to hear jokes about, but it, because it's such a strong news story, you, you have to cover it. And the same with Trump, you know, you have to sort of cover it. So you have to try and find ways of making it new and fresh, but hopefully, and genu uh, generally, Ian's got the harder task here, because they generally give him the... The week after we had the, the, me being given the question of Kim Jong-un firing missiles, I did sort of, I complained to the... I said, I can't make anything funny about this. I said, I, what can I do? So the next week, my question was about the shortage of humus in supermarkets. Now, it was a relief. The audience felt sort of like, oh, this, is, you know, this isn't World War III, this isn't nuclear war, this is just the shortage of humus. So it was a, being funny about that is, was, was a sort of release, I think, and the audience were very happy to hear that. So you can never judge really what the... A funny story is, is, is good, but sometimes we had... One of our best shows we've had in a long time was about two weeks ago when Rod Gilbert was hosted, and it was just... It just the whole thing sparked. He was very nervous beforehand, uh, but he's a very funny man, but he was very nervous about doing it, and that, his energy sparks off a kind of... You know, you've got something to bounce off. If somebody's being quite sort of... Oh, I've done this a few times before, looking into the camera, and they're doing it, you know, perfectly well, but they're not, there's no energy about it. It's harder to get comedy going, so it, it doesn't always depend on the news, it depends on the people that are doing it, that, are in, that you, you have the rapport amongst the people in the studio. I don't think we should underplay the shortage of hummus. Um, that no, 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 I, <laughs> I, I, I didn't wish to appear that I was being frivolous on the subject. <laughs> okay. Good, just wanted to clarify. <laughs> yeah, let's go uh, to you in the corner. Clarify, that's almost a humorous joke, isn't it? Something about <laughs> something being clarified in my <laughs> Hi, Paul. Um, Hi. Building on from uh, something that was mentioned earlier by my friend at the back here, um, the very obvious um, 
negative friction between Joe Brand and Quentin Letts, which showed itself in the previous week. Um, I often wonder what goes on behind the scenes when there has been a confrontation on the show like that. I remember one specific incident. I think Clive Anderson may have been filling in for you, but Piers yes. Morgan was yes. on, and him and Ian were exchanging some pleasantries with each other. That's um, right, yes. And I often wonder, uh, once the show is over, is it a case of shaking hands and going to the back for a drink, or does that carry on backstage? Um, well, with the Quentin Let's Show last week, you have a, it's, it's filmed at London Weekend Television. There's a bar area sort of on the 14th floor that's not particularly, you know, it's, it's just a sort of room. Um, I didn't see Quentin Let's Go. Uh, I didn't talk to him afterwards. Um, myself and Joe were chatting and Ian was chatting and the producers come over and chat. But, um, yeah, I, I didn't feel I'd need to, to know Quentin Let's any more than I already did. Um, so yeah, they just disappear. You don't have to, you're not forced to, you know, you don't, uh, no. <laughs> I know, there was no pleasantries afterwards. I mean, he had some friends with him, or people who paid to be his friends, I don't know. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, you don't, it's not, a, there's not a force, you don't have to sit down and have dinner with them or anything like that, you know, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, generally speaking, you, I mean, what I would normally do is afterwards I would say to the guests, well done, that was good, you know, because they're very nervous, they haven't done it before, they've only done it a few times before, and it is, it, it's, when you've been doing it for a long time, it's not so nerve-wracking. And my job, whoever I've got on my team, is to put them at their ease, to make them feel comfortable, uh, to make sure they enjoy it, really. And so afterwards I'll just say, well, you know, well done, that was good, that was great, just something like that. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's sort of, sometimes it's conversations afterwards, sometimes they're not, but, you know, I'm always asking who's on next week and what about that joke, is that going to be in and is that, you know, and all that sort of stuff, but uh, no, no, no great inquest really, but uh, just a general get-together afterwards, yeah. No, no great stories, I'm afraid. <laughs> all right, thank you for that question. Yeah, let's go to you. Um, like quite a lot of people, I imagine, I like to play just a minute socially. Um, do you have any advice on being a bit better at it? <laughs> um, yeah, play it for 30 years is probably the... I, I, was, I, I remember it just about starting. I mean, the thing is about it's... Um, yes, don't talk too quickly. Because uh, on, the, on, the, on the radio show, you can, if, you, if you set off and you decide that your pace is going to be rather measured and you're taking your time to speak, nobody can accuse you of, of hesitation. Um, try, it's, I mean, the key to it really is the programme is not to speak for a minute successfully because then you wouldn't get any challenges and you wouldn't get the fun of it. So I think it's just... Uh, a, a try, I mean, it's just... Practice is like anything, really. Um, I, I, how do you do when you play this socially? Um, top is probably going about 40 seconds. That's pretty good. You know, that's, uh, you know, anything over, once you get into double figures, I think that's pretty good. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, but it's, 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 you know, the fun of it is, it's just really is the sort of, the, 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 the impossibility of it, really. And if it was, if it was uh, any easier, it would, I think a programme where people just spoke for a minute the whole time, without committing the three sins of hesitation, repetition or deviation, would be dull after a while. So uh, I think 40 seconds is very good. <laughs> Great, thank you for that. Um, yeah, let's go to you. Just wait for the microphone. Hi, um, your early talk of impressions put me in mind of the much earlier episode you did with Mike Yarwood. Oh yes, yes. Um, and I was wondering if you thought there was much future in that sort of branch of comedy in the UK, and also the, the double act, which was quite popular when Mike was mm. doing his thing. Well, the, the double act is sort of is 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 kind of changed over the years. It's sort of the, if we, I suppose, the classic double act, the, the Morgan and Wise, but they, they started off when they were like in their teens, and they were together a long time before they became popular. In fact, in the very early days, Ernie Wise was the comedian, and Eric was the straight man. Now, I don't know if you have so much definition these days. Do you, do you have a straight man and a funny man and a double act? They, they tend to both be kind of amusing, I suppose. I don't know if there is so much of that sort of delineation anymore. Um, impressions are always, we, we, you know, we always find impressions very amusing when they work well. I mean, I, 
I, I'm slightly ashamed of the fact that when Mike Yarwood was on, that was a long time ago, but he, he was famous for his Howard Wilson impression, and I, I, I beat him to it. I did an impression of Howard Wilson before him, which I shouldn't have done, really. But I was kind of showing off, so I just, you know, I, I did my, my brief Howard Wilson impression, which I won't do now because it, 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 it would bring the house down. <laughs> <laughs> and it would hardly sort of be topical comedy, would it? Um, but I used to love him, Peter Sellers, you know, I, I was a big fan of Peter Sellers in an early day and I used, to, I used to be able to do a couple of impressions and there was one that he did, there's a classic Ealing film called Kind Hearts and Coronets um, and that where, you know, you, you look like you know, you know it, so the way Alec Guinness plays eight different parts and he plays the part of a vicar that uh, is being interviewed by Dennis Price and Alec Guinness, this was the impression that Peter Sellers did on the Michael Parkinson show, and the show was released on an LP, so I used to listen to this LP to try and get the impression. So it feels like in these sort of circumstances, this, this, these environments, I should try it. So this is Alec Guinness as the old vicar in Kind Hearts and Coronets. If you don't know the film, this impression is spot on. <laughs> the view from my west window has all the exuberance of Chaucer with none of the concomitant crudities of the period. <laughs> That's Alec Guinness. Thank you for that question. Um, Didn't think I'd yeah. be doing that tonight. Let's go to you. <laughs> Out of all the politicians you've had on the show over the years, who would you have on again and why? Perhaps I can answer your question by taking the exact opposite of what you said. Who I, who I, who I wouldn't have on again. Um, all the politicians... Well, let me try and answer your question first of all. Um, they were strange breed politicians. Um, they have to be, because you have to be quite thick-skinned, because people from an early age are going to challenge your, your, you know, your, your opinions, and so you, you can't take that to heart too much, I suppose. Um, politicians we've had on again. Caroline Lucas, the Green Party, she was, she was an exception in that she was a very, you know, she, she was a very normal individual. Um, <laughs> Some of them are very odd. They aren't very odd. Um, Anne Widdicombe, now you've forced it out of me, um, she hosted the programme twice. The first time she did it, um, it was kind of OK, and it was, you know, beginner's enthusiasm, and the audience sort of liked her uh, and stuff. And the edited version went out, and all the mistakes were cut out, and all that sort of stuff. And her friends, or maybe herself, had convinced her that she'd done a really good job on it, because in the edit, it looked fine, you know. So the second time she came on, she was telling the producers which jokes would work, which wouldn't work. She at one point said to me, come on, be funny, that's what you're being paid for, which is still the lowest point of my professional career. <laughs> being given showbiz advice by Anne Widdicombe. Um, I've made myself feel ill just sort of talking about it. Michael Heseltine, who's never been on the show, but this is an example of politicians will say anything, you know, really, if, if whatever suits them at that particular moment. Uh, I said to him, have you ever been asked to be on Have A Good News View? Never heard of it, he said. And this was about three weeks after his then leader, William Hague, had hosted it. So, I mean, he, he obviously knew what the show was. But I think politicians generally, um, they, it's... They, what passes for wit in the House of Commons is quite thin stuff outside. So then they're, they're not always that good, but um, they're always welcome, he said. If, uh, yeah, but I, I can't think of anyone I'd want to have back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question. Uh, yeah, let's go to here. Hi. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you because I'm pretty sure my first memories of proper comedy are whose line is it anyway, and I've got these old cassette tapes. Um, yeah, and just watching you and Josie Lawrence and Clive Anderson. Um, well, we, we still do a show, Josie does a sh at the Comedy Store on a Sunday, so Josie's is there every Sunday. If you go to the Comedy Store website, you'll see it, so come along one night. We do an impro thing, which is very much like whose line. We started off before whose line, but it, yeah, it still works very well. Mm. Um, yeah, anyway, my question. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, 
are you are you ever worried about either being replaced on Have I Got News for You or Have I Got News for, being, for You being cancelled? It comes from a good place. I said I was a fan. Um, <laughs> but you'd like to see somebody else do what I do. <laughs> well, I think Anne Widdicombe would be my ideal choice. <laughs> um, you can't be complacent in show business because you can't, you know, you, you, you have to be employed by somebody else. So you, it's... Um, if, I mean, particularly in the stuff that I do it, with improv, you, you, you can't sort of just busk it or, or, or phone it in because you, you, it's, you can't do the show you did the time before. So you always have to be as be do the best you can do. Sometimes you're not, it's not quite firing for you, but you've got to always keep trying because at some point, you know, show business careers do end and somebody might say at some point, oh, it needs to be freshened up or whatever. But so far that, that, ha that point hasn't been arrived at. Um, but you, you, can't, you can't discount it, so you, you always, always try and do the gig like this is your one opportunity to do the gig and then they'll ask you back. That's, that's my sort of philosophy on it, so I'm always trying to sort of, I'm not, not resting on my laurels, essentially, if I have any. Great, we have time for a couple more. Uh, yeah, let's go to you. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, the programme you did where you went and did um, like popular holiday experiences, and you went to Ibiza and went on a cruise and things like that. Yes. Um, I was wondering whether any particularly good bits or bad bits or things you'd actually do again? Um, India was really an uh, exciting place to, to, to be filming. Um, and we were there for sort of, I, I suppose, about two months, two and a half months. Um, there was... If you, when you go to somewhere like India or China, and you, you need to have some really good people with you. You need to have really good technical people. So the cameraman is the guy that's getting up on the hotel roof at four o'clock in the morning to shoot the beautiful sunset, or he's picking out faces in a marketplace uh, and whatever. Um, I had a, in India, I had a, an experience where the, 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 the director was unfortunately an idiot. Uh, and <laughs> He had no sense of humour and was trying, kept trying to make things difficult for me, thinking that would be funny. Now, the people I was interviewing were very good because the uh, production assistants had gone out there, they'd found really good people. So, so the, the programme looked great. The programme wasn't affected by the fact that this guy was foolish. But he was, for example, there was, there was a moment when I was singing karaoke in a bar and they picked a song which is like got three octaves, and, which I can't possibly do. And they thought it'd be funny to watch me not singing very well. We're actually, you know, you want to see somebody struggling at first and then be able to do it, otherwise you're just watching somebody who's not very good at something. And so trying to explain humour to him and comedy to him was very difficult. I said, look, the humour will, uh, will happen naturally. I'll be speaking to somebody, I'll get to know them, something will come across, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be fine. But at one point, because uh, I think I was very nervous making this show, because it was stressful at times because of the, 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 the director, um, we, he said to me, I'd been eating a very basic diet because I was having a lot of tummy troubles. I was basically eating naan bread and rice, like the plainest things you can find, you know. And he said, this would be really funny. He said, I want you to do a piece of the camera about how you've come to India and you can't eat anything. And I said, well, doesn't it sound a little bit sort of like I don't like Indian food or something? He said, no, it'll be hilarious. It'll be funny. OK, so, all right, so you, you always want to try and please the director because you're there to make a film and you don't, you don't want to be a prima donna. I hate all that sort of business of that, you know. We're there to make the best programme we can. So he sat me in the corner of a restaurant about an hour before the restaurant opened and I started talking and I said, um, uh, he said, now tell me about the, the naan bread and the rice. I started talking about, I said, well, I, you know, I, I, since I've been here, I've got a bit of a dodgy tummy. I, I've been eating naan bread and rice. In fact, I, I thought this might happen, so I brought my own rice with me in a suitcase over from London. I was just making stuff up. He said, cut, 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 cut. I said, what is it? He said, well, it's not true, is it? <laughs> uh, I said, what is it? Well, he didn't bring a suitcase of rice here. We can't use that. I said, well, I mean, it wasn't a great joke anyway, but the fact I did know it was a joke and so that was very difficult. My wife here, Suki, was an absolute ambassador because she was, became the link between me and the rest of the production because I stopped talking to them after a while because they were, they were pushing the crew too hard. The crew have got a sort of, you know, you've got one couple of cameras here. You imagine if you're going abroad, you've got so many silver boxes full of stuff. The check in and out of airports takes forever. You've got to go through security. These guys, you know, you may be sort of filming in 98 degrees Fahrenheit, but they've also got a huge camera on their shoulder, you know, and a sound guy's got a boom. So they're, they're working harder than you. And they weren't being treated well. So it was, 
the key thing to it all in the end was if you're in that kind of program, if there's going to be a weak link, it should be the director because you can work around that. The cameraman can be really good and can follow what's happening. The sound guys on it, the, the contributors that you're interviewing have been really well hand-picked. I mean, at one point, just an illustration of just how some people just don't get it. This is the camera here. The camera's looking towards the Ganges. It's filming there. The director is here smoking a cigarette. And the cameraman has to tell him to stop smoking a cigarette because it's drifting across the lens. <laughs> now, that's pretty basic. I don't know if I've answered your question, but I have certainly... <laughs> given a character assassination to a person I haven't named. <laughs> Have you got time for one more? Uh, I hope it's not the director. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's go to you, the purple arm. Yeah. Um, so obviously you've had a very successful career, which of how I got into view is just a small part of, and I was wondering how you felt about the prominence of the show and how you felt about having such a platform, in a sense. Um, well, it, it is, you know, it's like everything, I mean, I, every, the three things I do, the Comedy Store players have been going since 1985, um, Just a Minute since 1988, well, well it was going before I, I joined for 20 years, Have I New, News has been going since 1990, so they are continuous, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I just, I, as I said at the top, I think, talking about the clowns and stuff, the fact that it's still getting millions of people watching it, that we're still getting a sort of combined figure of, on this Friday night and the Monday night repeats of about five and a half million, which in this day and age is extraordinary. The fact that five and a half million are laughing at stuff that I do is just, it's overwhelming really, it's incredible. I, I'm eternally grateful in the end to the viewers that watch it because if nobody watched it, we, we wouldn't have a show. So um, long may it continue, I suppose. Yeah, it's, 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 it's great, it, it really is wonderful. It's, you know, the, you always wanna to play to the biggest audience possible. So to still be able to do that after 27 years of the show and you know just a minute gets a good figure as well and the comedy store has room for you on a Sunday night um, <laughs> so yeah it's it's I'm I'm more successful than I could have dreamed of great thank you so much Paul for joining us well thank you please Chris, join me you. in thanking Paul Merton <laughs> <laughs>